seat. Let's um Okay. Hey, so we good? Hey, why don't you grab a seat if you're just coming in? Um, so we're doing, we have a, a, a I think a cool class today. We have a couple different things that we're doing. The title that I gave it is Things We Do Not See. And uh, one, one thing uh, that we don't see is uh, we're, the second part of the class, we're going to talk about discrimination as something that we don't see. And usually discrimination is a thing that you, you, can't, you, you can't really identify it when it's happening. So, hey, if you just came in, get a seat, okay? Grab a seat, we're gonna get started, okay? There's a lot of seats down in the front, so just come down here. Um, but the other thing is uh, a guest uh, that we have. So, yeah, here, I'll do it. So back in 1983, when I was just starting, finishing my undergrad and starting my master's work, I came upon a book about Northeast Brazil. And Northeast Brazil is the area of Brazil that historically has been the, the, the poorest and most deprived. I mean, like, man, back in, the book was about Brazil in the 1970s. So it, it it, the, it was mind-blowing because I had seen images, like many of us do, about reality in the less developed world, and particularly the part of the world that is extremely impoverished. Um, but I had never really read about it. And so it, it, it absolutely opened my eyes to, to something I had just not seen. And so if you look at these numbers here, extreme 720 million people in the world are living in what is called extreme poverty. And extreme poverty is poverty in which you people cannot or don't know how they're going to meet their basic needs of food, water, shelter. Um, that's about 9% of the planet, which is just an, an, an extraordinary extraordinarily large number of people. And, and on average, it's about $2.15 or less per day that people are living on. And it's just, you, if you don't, you, I can't explain how profoundly my life has been impacted by time that the people who I have met and the time, I don't even know how to say it, honestly. I don't know how to say it without it just sounding crass or something, but the, the people who I have met and the, the things that I have seen and, uh, it's, it's, it's just, it's profound, man. So, um, that's what we're going we're gonna, to, we're going to have a conversation with somebody, uh, and, and, I, and we're going to, and some people, and they're going to tell their story a little bit, and then we're going to move in a different direction. But right now, before we do that, can you just pop your phones out, and we're going to do the quiz. And remember, if you, for some reason, you can't get on Wi-Fi, you need to right now, not at the end of class, right now, take a selfie with this up on the stream, on the screen. Okay? Are we golden? There's your there's your code. 
It's not open. Hey, hey, Julie. Thirty seconds. Hang on, it'll open in just a couple seconds. All right, Mom. Is it good? What's that? No, no, no. Is it working? We'll we'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. And just hold off. We'll come back to it in a few minutes. Okay. Tell. All right, man. So, um, so we'll keep going. We'll come back to it in a few minutes. So, in 2015. I went down to, uh, to Porto Alegre in Brazil and gave a talk. And I met this woman who was also speaking at this conference. And her name is Mari Lucy. And she I just told this story that was just an unbelievable story of a life that she, has, she lived, has lived. And it, it was so profound. And at the, at, at the end of her session, she and I had lunch together, and I, and I just knew that we were going to stay connected because she was just this really, really special person. And she lives in this area of Rio called Complexo do Alemão, and it's the German complex, and it's just a neighborhood. And it's a really poor neighborhood extremely poor. In fact, you know, the street, the police are constantly patrolling the neighborhood because there's a lot of poverty, a lot of crime, exceptional amount of crime. And so it's not uncommon to, to have gunfights break out at any time of the day, um, people being killed, police killing people with impunity, and just leaving the bodies on the streets. I mean, it's just really unbelievable. But she, Mari Lucy, has this idea that she doesn't want the kids to have to go through the things that she went through when she was a kid. So she started this project called Favela. Favela is the name of, of a poor neighborhood in an urban area in Latin America. And Favela Art. And she teaches, gives art classes and after school programs for kids. And they paint murals, and they paint paintings. And this is a mural that she and the kids painted. And these are some of the kids painting. And the kids just love it. They're just awesome, man, just awesome. And just an opportunity. Here's a photo of some, of the, some young girls um, who are part of this project. And these are kids, man. This is, you, you, you really need these. This is such a poor and such a violent neighborhood. And the kids come here and put smiles on their faces. It's so awesome. Look at, look at this young girl here and with this painting that she did. And this is me in my living room with a painting that I commissioned that they paint for me uh, using this style that they developed. And we, in Social 19, have been sponsoring this project for many years. In the library, we pay for all the books in the library. We paid to redesign uh, the school that they do. That says thank you, everyone, and Sam. These are the library shelves. Here are the kids. Um, awesome, right? And we sponsor the annual Christmas party for the kids. So what Mari Lucy says is, I just want to ensure that every child who wants one is going to get a single gift for Christmas. And so this is her in this photo. That's Mari Lucy there picking out, that little girl is picking out a doll. And what's kind of interesting 
if you notice that all these, yeah, it's picking out a doll, man. Yeah, no, what you notice is that the dolls are white dolls and brown dolls and black dolls, and the kids don't care, man. They don't care. It doesn't matter, man. They just want a doll. And it's so awesome to have this. So anyway, um, we're going to bring Marty Lucy in to the class. Mari Lucy, are you there? Can you hear us? Está conseguindo ouvir? Sim. Olá. Estão ouvindo? Sim. Sim. Olá, crianças. Olá. How are you? Qual o nome de vocês? Ele está perguntando como vocês estão. Como, how do you say? Como, como vai você? Ele está perguntando como vocês Tudo estão. Tudo bem. Tudo bem, graças a Deus. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so thanks for visiting our class today. Yeah. Ele tá falando obrigado por estar aqui para conversar com a gente hoje. Nós te agradecemos. She's saying thank you. Yeah, it's awesome, man. And hey, so the the what what's the name of the little girl right behind her? Um, para menina atrás de você, se você quiser dizer o seu nome. É, quer falar teu nome? Falado quer falar em livro. A N A C L A L A. Fala agora teu nome. Ana Clara. Ana Clara. Ana Clara. Quantos anos você tu tem? Doze. Doze. Twelve. Doze nove ou doze? Doze. Twelve. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, very good. So ask her what is her favorite subject in school. Então ele está perguntando qual que é a sua matéria favorita na escola agora. Matemática. Mathematics. Ah. She says. Hey, and she was signing, right? What what was she signing? Her her name. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Ah. Where did she learn to sign? Ah, uh, ele está perguntando para você onde você aprendeu a, a língua de sinal. Uh, her sister's deaf, so she has to she has to know how to communicate. Ah, very good. Hey, does anybody sign here? Anyone know how to sign? You know how to sign? Come here. Yeah, come here really fast. Hey, okay. and the girl, and the, okay, the girl next to her. Yeah, ask her the, the other girl's name. Ah, ele está perguntando qual que é o nome da da menina do seu lado também. Ingrid. Fala seu nome. Ingrid. Fala seu nome como. Não, nada com Oi, Idi? Ingrid. Ingrid? Ingrid, quantos anos você tem? Quantos anos você tem? Oito. What, what's her favorite subject? E a sua matéria favorita na escola agora? Pintar. Pintar. She says to paint and art. Loves painting and art. Ah, did she learn to paint and art from Mari Lucy? Did she learn to paint from Mari Lucy? Você aprendeu a fazer a sua arte pintada da Mari Lucy? É. Ela que te ensinou? Ah, ah good. Okay, go the first girl. Go back to her. Wait, are you good? I'm learning, Silver. You're learning? I know, I know a good amount. Tell her, can you say that, tell her that Social 19, no, that <laughs> Professor Sam okay. sends her love. Yeah? Okay. Here, you can get right here. Yeah. <laughs> Just ask if she understands. I think American Sign Language is different than Portuguese. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Tell her to respond. So, <laughs> deu deu para deu para entender ou estava difícil? Yeah. Ah. Ah. Good. Dude. Awesome. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, who else is there? Mari Luz, ask you, who else is there? Tem mais alguém aí com vocês ou é só vocês três? Oh, oh yeah, these guys. Yeah. Você já what's, as in, what's your name? Uh, ele está perguntando o nome de, de todo mundo aí. Luan e Lucas, os dois irmãos. Their names are Luan 
and Lucas. Yeah, so. quantos anos você tem? 18. 18. 18. So you, what, Lucas? 20. 20. Mm -hmm. And what are they doing? Are they studying? Ele está perguntando se vocês estão estudando ou estão indo para a faculdade agora. Sim. What are, they, here, what are they studying? Pode falar outra vez. They're they're both in or he's in university right now. So. Yeah. Has he learned English? Is he learning English? Ele está ele está perguntando para você se você está conseguindo aprender inglês aí no Brasil ou não. Sim. Okay, tell him. Okay, in that case, speak in English. Yeah. What? No, go ahead. Se conseguir, pode mandar bala. What what is what what is your favorite subject? Mesa mesa pergunta. Yeah. <laughs> tell me, okay, tell us something about Mari Lucy. Ele tá perguntando se você pode dizer alguma coisa sobre Mari Lucy que você que impressionou você. As artes dela, os desenhos he said, like, her art and her, like, painting skills and everything. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, when did he meet her? How old was he when he met her? E quantos anos você você uh, tinha quando você conheceu Mari Lúcia? Um cinco. Five, five years old. Yeah? Ah, okay, good. Yeah, heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Is anyone else there? Is that it? Uh, Lucas, also Lucas. Yeah, Lucas. Hey, Lucas. Hola, you, tudo bem? Hola. You speak English? Mais ou menos. Yeah? He said kind of. More or less. Yeah, okay. Listen, how are you doing? When when did you meet Mari Lucy? Ele está perguntando quando você conheceu Mari Lucy também. Uns oito anos. Eight years old, so... Yeah. How how are things in Complexo do Alemão? Então ele está perguntando para vocês agora como estão como está a situação aí no Complexo do Alemão em Rio de Janeiro. Normal, tá? Tudo bem. Tudo bem. Tudo bem. Yeah, he said it's pretty pretty good right now. It's okay right now. Yeah. It's calm. Yeah. Ele está perguntando se está se tá calmo aí ou não. Okay, let's go back to Mari Lucy. Sim. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Lucas. Yeah, thank you, gentlemen. Yeah. Hey, hola, Mari Lucy. Hola. Hola. Oh. Como vai? There's, there's one more. Ah, yeah, done. Um pouco de inglês, fala um pouco de inglês. Ele acabou de chegar do trabalho. Felipe. Hi, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice meeting you. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. How are you doing? Hey, Mari, so listen, Mari Lucy, how many kids are there for the Christmas party? Ele está perguntando quanto, quantas crianças vai ter lá na, na festa de Natal aí com vocês esse ano. Esse ano nós vamos ter duas atividades de Natal. Uma com um grupo de 50 crianças, que são as crianças assim, que a gente classifica como as especiais ou que tem ou os irmãos especiais. Quer que eu dê uma pausa para você depois continuar? Pode ser. So she said that this year they're having two activities. Yeah. One, uh, the first one is for um, special needs students and people with special needs um, siblings, and that's yeah. around 50 people. Yeah. Uh, pode continuar. Então, é, as crianças especiais a gente classificou okay, desde good. antes da pandemia, já estava já classificando e colocando elas por, é por fase, né? Que são as crianças que têm algum tipo de transtorno emocional por conta da violência, outros que desenvolveram transtornos por conta de é, excesso de, de hipermotivação, hiper, não é nem motivação, é... Estimulação. Muita tela, muito celular. E... Wait, 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 espera. Go ahead. Ah, 
It, it, um, she says, so for that first group, um, it's for kids that develop special needs or disabilities um, because of violence. And then it's also like including of people with like ADHD and like, um, yeah, that type of uh -huh, uh -huh, disability. Okay. okay. And the second group? Ele está perguntando sobre o segundo grupo. E o segundo grupo são 600 crianças, mas essas crianças são por área. Não dá para fazer a festa para todas juntas. Então, em cada área, são seis áreas, vão ser 100 crianças em cada área. So she said that the second group is around 600 kids, um, but it's by area. So they have six areas, 100 kids per like neighborhood, basically. Yeah. yeah. Is she working Legal. in every neighborhood? Uh, ele está perguntando para você se você vai trabalhar em todas as áreas uh, que vai ter evento ou não. Com certeza. Ah, em todas. awesome, awesome, yeah. Oye, awesome, yeah. Hey, so, Mari Lucy, uh, as always, eu te amo, yeah? Eu te amo? Ele está falando que eu te amo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Eu... So we're, we're going to, so so 2019, we're going to send money down for the party, okay? Ele está falando que a nossa aula aqui, a nossa classe aqui no Penn State vai vai mandar dinheiro aí para vocês, para a festa de Natal, para fazer tudo certinho aí. Tá ótimo. Obrigada. Obrigada. Yeah. She's, uh, she said, God bless you, and thank you guys yeah. so much. No, it's awesome. Tell her to say hi to her sister. Yeah. Sign, tell her to say hi to her sister for us. Ele está falando para você dar um oi e um abraço para sua irmã e para a gente. Yeah? <laughs> this, right here. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Okay, Mari Lucy, we will go. Yeah? Ciao. Yeah. Obrigado, Mario yeah. Lúcia, está yeah. yeah. Obrigado, gente. Tchau. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, dude, nice job, man. Thanks, Thank bro. You. Yeah. Hey, you know, you know what's awesome? Yeah, you can just do it. What's awesome is, like, they're talking from Rio, and they're just, they're just they're kids, man. They're just kids. Like, they're just people who, for whatever reason, were born there. And for whatever reason, each one of us was born somewhere else. And in a different place, in a different time. And it's, it's just amazing to have this connection to these things that we don't see. And you don't try to, if, if I go back to those numbers of, you know, 9% of the planet's population is living in extreme poverty. You don't worry about the hundreds of millions of people. Like, you don't do that. You just do what's right in front of you. And what's right in front of you sometimes is just the thing that you maybe didn't see before, and then suddenly you see. So every Christmas, we supply what we need to supply for the Christmas party for these folks. So you can send the money to me, and I send it down to them, and they will have a Christmas party, and the kids will have presents. So that's my Venmo, that's my Cash App. Um, so I'll take it down, okay? Every December we do this, so go ahead and fire off some money to me. You don't have to, but whatever. And if you don't have Venmo or Cash App, you just want to give me some cash, give it to me. And I'll be giving money to them also, so I'll make sure they get it. And that's where we are. And like for me, just how, how awesome it is that, I don't know, man. It's just awesome to have that connection, you know. All right, man. Are we ready? Can you also get your phones out? We're going to do the first quiz.
There's the number. It should be working. We good? Yeah? All right, man. Yo, if you can't get on, take, take the selfie with me standing down here and send it to Julie. Otherwise, we're on. There it is? All right. All right, so listen. Um, can we have our th the three volunteers? Why don't you guys come up? Hey, by the way, and on behalf of Marie Lucy and the kids, if, if you donated, thanks. Awesome. Thank you, man. It's awesome. It's cool. All right, so peeps, here's what we're going to talk about today. Um, what you all are going to talk about. We're going to have a conversation about discrimination just in the U.S., Okay, we're not going to talk about other places in the world. So why don't you introduce yourself? We'll start with you, Alan. Uh, hi, I'm Alan. I'm a sophomore currently at Penn State, double major in statistics and computer science. And I'm from Panama City, Panama. And I'm, I'm an international student. Panama City, Panama. Panama. Are you like the only Panamanian student at Penn State? No, there's quite a few actually. Yeah. Like, give it or take like 10 or 11. Oh, yeah. Okay, that I know of you. at least. Yep, got you. All right. Um, I'm Izzy. I'm from New York City. Um, oh, I'm majoring in biomedical engineering. Uh, and yeah, that's basically. <laughs> Dude, that, Hank, Dude. <laughs> that was awesome. All right, man. Izzy from New York City. Alan from Panama. Uh, Michael, I'm from Allentown, Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm majoring in computer science, and I'm a fourth year. And or is your ancestry, what's your ancestry, Chinese? Uh, Chinese and Taiwanese. Taiwanese? All right. Dude, you're Chinese and Taiwanese? Yes. What's that, what's that mean for you? Um, well, for me, uh, my mom came from Taiwan. And my dad came from mainland China. Uh, she was born there, so she considers herself to be Taiwanese. Uh-huh. Uh, for me personally, I don't think I like lean into one or the other more. Like I introduce myself as Chinese Taiwanese. Yeah. Um, but that's how I am. So. so that's probably good for the the conflict between China and Taiwan to have somebody like you who can live in both worlds. Yes. For me, um, and as somebody that knows a lot of people that come from mainland China. Uh, at least compared to people who are Taiwanese, um, it can definitely feel like um, not hostile, but there's definitely a certain camp that a lot of people fall under. Some, that yeah, that people who are more nationalistic, but probably yeah. most Chinese really don't give a damn. Yeah, mo most people don't care, and they play it off like some of my friends. They play it off as like a joke. And yeah, yeah, like yeah. They're nationalists, but they probably aren't. Do hoping. you guys follow? You know the conflict. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. So. Um, I want to. I want to see. Can you answer this question? Let, let's start, Alan. Let's start with you, man. How, how much racial? So, as a Panamanian, you can weigh in that. Weigh in on this as an outsider. Like, how much do you think exists in the U.S.? How much racial discrimination exists in the United States? Um, I know it's rude to answer a question with another question, but in what way? Go ahead. I don't know. What do you mean? Because sometimes you see like what Americans call microaggressions, which is when people like mislabel you. I personally uh, have had a few very unsavory experiences, both at Penn State. Unsavory? That's how I call them. Yeah. Because I cannot prove that they came from a place of hate, but like in the 21st century, ignorance to me is a choice, especially here in the US where everybody has access to the internet. And um, 
long story short, someone was making fun of me because I'm Panamanian, given a conflict that we had had with Colombia before. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like... Um, Wait, was it a Colombian? No, it was not a Colombian. All right, okay. Which is the funny part. All Most right, okay. Colombians are just chill like that. Um, so, but racial discrimination, being discriminated because I'm black, only has happened a few times since I came here, and it was all the time by Americans. And, but, but what, and what do you mean by discrimination? Like, what... what well, the typical, like, they follow you in Target or something like that. <laughs> they, they do what? Like, oh. follow you in Target. Like, oh, you happens, felt like, okay. Like, it happened to me one time. Okay. Um, it was not in State College. I was in uh, Westchester, Philadelphia, in Penn uh -huh. uh, Pennsylvania. Uh-huh. Um, but in Penn State, most people are just cool like that. Some people are not, um, and I have had quite a few encounters, like one or two. Wait, um, hang on, dude. Hang on, hang on. So I want to, I'm going to, so the three of you, I, I chose the three of you because we're going to really dig into this, okay? Because my, I want to look at, I, I want to have a conversation about how much discrimination is actually happening. So I'm going to just keep pushing back in lots of different ways, okay? Including like your, including like this. So you said quite a few encounters and then you said, one or two, I think, right? Yeah. Do quite a few. When we're talking about race discrimination, quite a few is like quite a few. And two is two. So I want to push, I just want to be clear here, yeah. okay? And be fair, because I really want to try to answer this question today in, in, a, fair, in a fair way. I want to try to answer it, okay? So that when we leave here today, we have some way that we could hang our hats on an answer to it. So, all right. So, so you had a couple, yeah, a couple that you would call discrimination, or would you call them like an actual action, or would you yeah, call it just uh, action? The ones that I call actual discrimination is because there was an action involved. Okay, Which okay, was, yeah, yeah. Um, Izzy, how would you, how would you answer that question? Um, well, you know, as a person, I've personally experienced discrimination, not to like a certain degree where you know it would like it like hurt me emotionally. Um, like, but there are, there are a myriad of things that you can discriminate against, you know, especially in America, you know, um, Dude, especially in anywhere. And, and like, but people of color here make up, of, um, the minority of the population. So if you're talking about generally speaking, not a lot of discrimination happens because the most of this country is one race, you know, most people are straight. Most people are cisgender. You know, those people will not experience discrimination from their own group, but those minorities will experience a greater concentration of discrimination among their own group. So there, I could say that it occurs frequently, but it will not happen to most people. Okay, but what's frequently? Like when he, when Alan said, for example, yeah, n numer did you say numerous times? I don't remember. In Penn State, two times. Okay, two times. Is that frequent, is that, what year are you, by the way? I'm in my sophomore year. Your sophomore year, okay, so second year. So really only one year and a half yeah. here, right? Three semesters, is that frequently? Yeah, I mean, I could say that you would expect to experience some kind of, like, discomfort in any new environment that you find yourself in as, like, a minority, as a person of color. If you're going to a new college, if you're moving into a new place, when okay. you're assimilating yourself into that environment. A new country, it, yeah. Yeah, and a new, especially a new country. It really opens the gates, and it also makes you more aware of where, what is happening and what people may be thinking and saying about oh, you. Okay, so hang on, though, right? So what I heard what you said was, hey, by the way, you, you, the three of you are good, right? If I'm going to just push. I'm going to push on a lot of things. So it's going to, don't let it, it's, I'm not, I'm not arguing, I'm not arguing with them, I'm trying to get clarity, okay, so I want to be really clear about that. So discomfort is not discrimination, so, but you equated discomfort with discrimination, so can you? I'm not equating it necessarily, when someone is discriminated against, they will, if, if they're aware of it, I've been discriminated against, and I haven't realized until years later, I'm like, oh, yeah. you're being racist, but um, it's like if they went this come when someone you're being discriminated against and no one really cares like you don't care the person doesn't think they're being racist or they're being sexist yeah. and you know nothing really happens but um, especially when like you when you are more hyper aware of it and then when you do experience that discomfort 
I feel like it is an, it's an integral part of being discriminated against and how it makes you okay, feel. Okay, okay. So what you, when you're saying discomfort, this is good that you're clarifying here because what, what it sounded like before, and this is what happens in these kinds of conversations, right? Izzy is saying, yeah, you feel a certain kind of discomfort, but you were saying the discomfort of discrimination, not yeah. that discomfort is discrimination. Yeah, no, generally isn't. Just because okay, someone makes yeah. you feel like you're being pushed back, maybe you're asked about your race or your ethnicity or something, yeah. and you are uncomfortable speaking about it, doesn't mean that it's necessarily offensive or discriminatory. Got so if I ask you about your hair, for example, yeah. right? It's like you could you could interpret that or your hair, you can interpret it in one way. I um, could get offended if I wanted to, yeah, but that doesn't you. mean you're trying to offend me. Yeah, I got you, yep. Or that I'm actually offending you. You might just be in that moment super hypersensitive. Yeah. You, yeah, you walk on a bed like I have sometimes. And I just like, I wake up and students, maybe some student wants something from me. I'm just like, no. And the other 364 days of the year, I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. All right. So, Okay, but I want to go back to one thing, and then we're going to get you to Michael. So, Alan said a couple times, and you said, yeah, okay, a couple times. A couple times isn't very often, right? If you think about the amount of days that you've spent, say, like here in, in the U.S. or here at Penn State, the amount of interactions you have every day with people, the amount of inter opportunities you would have for people to do something discriminatory toward you, Two is like, uh, okay, yeah, right. I'm just going to say that I lived 18 years of Pan in Panama. Yeah. And it didn't happen once. Yeah, yeah, you didn't have it once. <laughs> yeah. So two in, what, three semesters? It's quite a few. Okay. And yes. And maybe, maybe not. There. I mean, it's all relative, right? I'll, and I'm, all, I'm speaking for, other, for people who are going to say, yeah. yeah, two. Look, for, for example... I don't, I don't have it in the U.S. I've had a few moments with, different, with people where I'm like, yo, man, what was that about, right? Mm -hmm. But when I travel, I get it, you know, when I, but it's different, right? So when I lived in Ecuador, for example, I would get it all the time. But I was the white man among the indigenous people in Ecuador. So I'm like, okay, that's cool. Like, it was one of these things where I, I'll just deal with it. But I dealt with it every day, mm -hmm. right? So that was a lot, it felt like to me. But nonetheless, it still is too, I would say, yeah, it all. Michael, how about you, man? How would you answer this question? Um, I think a lot of racial discrimination can be, I don't know what the right word is, but it can be like very undertoned. Uh, like, people might not be very conscious that they're doing it. Uh-huh. Um, but it's definitely, it can come off as discriminatory. Or it can happen without anyone even ever seeing it. Like, right. Like Izzy said. Right. And so, at least for me, um, personally, if I'm going to take this from a personal, like, viewpoint, uh, like, especially recently, within the past year, um, I have this uh, Chinese friend, and she often gets upset whenever she notices it, um, like discriminatory towards Chinese people. Uh -huh. And a tangible example is like all the like China memes that yeah. you see like, oh, social credit minus 10,000 or like, like the sports related ones where it's like, oh, get, get ready to learn Chinese, buddy, or you are Guangdong tiger or something like that, right? And then it's just like, well, why do people find that funny, you know? And I remember her saying it. I was like, wait, I don't know, you know? And uh -huh. it's like, I remember I was laughing at that stuff too. And it's like, I didn't get why it was funny. Um, is it supposed to be poking fun at Chinese people? Like, I don't know what the core of it is. And even now, like today, I could talk to some of my friends and they would probably say some of these jokes. Um, but it can definitely come off as discriminatory because it feels like, it can feel like to some people that, oh, this is, like, Chinese people are being made fun of, like, at the expense of them. At the expense of themselves, right. in a way. So what's your gut feeling? If you, if you had to answer this question then, dude, thanks for that. I, you know, if you had to answer this question, how much racial discrimination exists in the U.S. across the board, 
What would you say? Yeah, I think with that in mind, honestly, probably still a lot. I think people just aren't aware of it uh, okay. as much as they might think. Okay. All right. So let's be clear. Uh, So there's discrimination, which we're going to talk about as an action. There's like intolerance or bigotry, right. or stereotypes, any number of things we can talk about as some kind of attitude. And then there's racism, which is an attitude on high octanes, for example, right? Like most of what people call racism is, is probably... Um, it's just bigotry. It's just a stupid. It's a stereotype bigotry, right? Like the, the like make like a meme about Chinese people, right. right? Racism. It's like that. That's a word that we reserve for thing things that are really intense, right? Like when you use the racism word, you can if you say bigotry. If someone accuses me of being a bigot, I'm, it's like. Okay, big, no one, my boss is, I'm not getting like a phone call or an email or anything. No one, it's going to be, yeah, I heard you were a bigot in 119. Okay. But if I'm accused of being a racist, that, that, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hear about it, right? Discrimination is, is taking those ideas in an action based on probably some stereotype or some sense of bigotry, right? So you would say fairly often. Yes. And Izzy, you would say, yeah, fairly often. often. And you would say? Quite a few times. Fairly often here in the US. So if you look out at all Maybe. these black and brown people in the class, yeah. you would say like, yeah, or people who are gay or lesbian. And white people? In the US? Yeah. I don't see how. Like, then again, I'm not white, so I'm not really sure how can you can discriminate. Well, one way is because you know, yeah. poor white people are all, very often discriminated against, right? Yeah. And you know, because it's a class thing, and class is a, a point of discrimination. Yeah. So, based on based on class, based on where you live, based on how you talk, yeah. based on any number of things, you could be discriminated. And you could be discriminated against simply because you're white which many yeah, white people true. have the idea that is happening on a fairly regular basis, but that's just because we have largely a, m many, yeah, many white people have the idea that they're discriminated against on a regular basis, right? The tables have been flipped. Yeah, is it the white replacement theory? The white replacement thing, the white, what, whatever it is, right? Reverse racism, reverse discrimination, so we have that, right? Okay, so here, let's do this. I want to go through a few things. So take a look at this. So this is a lifetime likelihood see, that of imprisonment in the U.S. Residents born in 2021, okay, the lifetime likelihood. And when you look at that, you know, like all men, let's just stick with all men, for example. Right, all men, one in nine, white men, one in 17. The likelihood that a white man born in 2021 will be imprisoned at some point in their lives is one in 17. Black men, one in three. Latino men, one in six. So we don't have Asians on here, bro, which is a point you could make an argument that like this is the thing, why aren't we looking at Asians? Why aren't we looking at Native Americans? So what does that say to you? What's uh, that say to you, bro? Well, I'm a statistics major, so I'm going to put my degree to use. Um, well, I'm black and Latino, so I don't know how I would fit into that. But correlation does not equal causation. Are okay. those people being in prison not because they're black, uh -huh. but because they're criminals? Yeah, because, they're cri because they've done, or because they've either done some kind of criminal yeah. thing or they've been arrested for something that's criminal. Yes. But it's something, not because they're black, it's of just that of all black men born in 2021, one in three will end up in prison for one reason or another. I don't think you can tie it to skin color. It's just someone that happened to be black. And in the US at least, most crime, this is across all societies, most okay. crime is correlated to income. Yeah. Because every, any place okay. that you're gonna go, the poor people 
are often going to be uh, indulging in uh, illegal activities. Okay. And in the U.S., uh, income is also divided by race. Okay. This is something that we have talked about this in this class. So the question that I boil down to the Bureau of Justice statistics is that are those people committing the crime because they're black or because they're poor? Okay. And if they're poor, why are black people more poor for as or why? Is okay, okay, reason? good question. Dude, good question. Yeah. Izzy. I mean, yeah. I mean, you can't say that, like, this is just like that, oh, just, you know, black people tend to be cri commit crimes more often. You know, it's more of, um, like, if this were, if these statistics were to, like, reflect the actual population, then you would be able to say that, oh, all these people committed a crime and they were tried justly, all of that. And, you know, but there are a myriad of factors that do tie into your race, like your class and where you live, your background, uh, your criminal history. Okay, okay. That all contribute and all make it harder for someone to keep out of jail. Okay, okay, so here, let me do this. Do, I, do, do we have, bro, are, are, you, are you middle class? You're middle class. Are you middle class? I don't remember. Do, are, do, give me like three middle class. Dude, can you stand up? I need three black men who are middle class. Dude, do we have, do we have a, a two more black guys who are middle class? Or upper middle class? There's barely any black people here in the first place. So. Shut <laughs> here, we're going to go with, we, we're going to go with, if we, get, if we get three of him, this guy, he's not likely to, he's middle class, right? Yeah. He's not likely to end up in jail. Like, what's your name again, bro? Elijah. Elijah. Remember Elijah? He yeah, was up here before. He's not, gonna, he's not likely to end up in jail. You bro, could get 10 or 50, 20 Elijahs, and 10 or 20 Elijahs even. Right here, if, we had, if all this row was black, middle class black men, yeah. none of them are likely to end up in jail. So, so what you're saying, uh, thanks, bro. So what you're saying by, yeah, it depends on, a, what the two of you are saying, it depends on many, many different factors, right, class and so on. Yeah, yeah because you get middle class black men at Penn State University are, are not, that's, they're not going to end up in jail. So then, Very therefore, I mean, some of them might, one of them might, but therefore, the numbers like this, you have to take a step back and say, wait, what does that actually mean? The thing is that people draw conclusions from statistics like those, and that's nothing more than an observational study. Like okay. You cannot infer causation from any of those things. That's yeah, there's, how you no, there's no causation. It's all Abs correlation. And people take that as the gospel yeah. and say that, oh, black people are more likely to commit a crime. That doesn't mean that black people, that I'm more likely to commit a crime than anyone else. No. That just means that the people that commit the crime happen to be black. Yes. But it's not because they're black. So here, let me give you an yeah. example. In, 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 in a city, I remember a few years ago, Newark, Delaware, Okay, yeah. the city of Newark, Delaware is very black. Man. You know, when you're in the suburbs, it's very white. You go into the city, it's very black. Yeah. The Newark was the crime capital of the United States, the murder capital of the United States about yeah. eight years ago. Newark, Delaware. Yeah. Delaware. But it wasn't Newark, Delaware. It was actually a four block radius in Newark, Delaware. So people living outside of that four block radius, were, it's very different statistical possibility of either being murdered or being a murderer. In the four blocks, however, all sorts of nefarious stuff was going on. And so the problem is when you zoom out and we say, hey, Newark, Delaware is a really dangerous city. It wasn't really a dangerous city, but this yeah. four block radius was a dangerous area. Black people in Newark, Delaware weren't committing murder. Black people inside this four block area were much more likely to be involved in violent activities in somewhere else. So th I'm responding p affirmatively to what it is that you're naturally thinking. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense? Yeah, I wouldn't say they're more likely to commit a crime. I don't see how likelihood plays into all of this. Like their situations okay, that's a good might okay. push them to commit a crime, but that doesn't mean that they're more likely to do so just because they're born in that place. Okay, likelihood right, is not you. the word that I would use. Probability might be the better. Uh, the probability. The okay, probability all right, probability. Yeah, all right, we can go with that. Bro, do you have anything that you would... I mean, I pretty much agree with both of them. Like, it is much more than just based on race, at least when it comes to, oh, why is it one in three for black men? Um, it definitely depends on other factors like class, right? Uh, I think class is actually a pretty big one. It's, it's yeah. huge, the intersection, right? So with this says black men, and what it should say is, hang on a second, 
we actually have many different, we got three or four different stats here. Black men in this population, the, the, the likelihood of ending up in prison is, is one in X. Black men in this population, the likelihood is one in Y. Black men in this population over here is going to be one in, in Z, for example, right? But black men as a whole, it's going to be this other thing. But nonetheless, this different, but that's not what we see. We see something like this, and then people say, oh, my God, black men are 33% of them are criminals. 33% of them are criminals implying, is what that when, says. When that's not true at all. Yeah, no, but no, because, because that's not what the data are, right? Yeah. And that's, the pro that's why we're having this conversation to air it out. And I'm sure people on the stream are having fun chatting about it. Here, yeah. let me ask you, let me do another thing here, okay? So one of the things, the problems with, one of the problems with discrimination is you can't see it. So the title of the class is Things That We Do Not See. Discrimination you rarely see. So the three of you may have been discriminated against many, I may have been discriminated against many times for any number of reasons, but like we don't see it. In most discrimination you can't see, and you wouldn't see. If you go to rent an apartment in downtown State College and they don't rent it to you, you, you have no idea that they didn't rent it to you because you're Chinese, Taiwanese, and you don't know that they, they wouldn't have rented it to you for any reason, right? And, and you don't know, like you really have no idea. So it's the hidden stuff. And so what we do in this world is we have to find ways to isolate and identify the discrimination so that we know if a certain behavior happens, we can attribute it to one thing and not another, okay? So here's an example of a study. They took resumes and they sent the resumes out to people, to jobs, on, based on newspaper advertisements and online advertisements, right, for jobs. And the resumes were exactly the same. They had two, you would have two resumes here. And they're exactly the same, okay? All they did was change the name. Okay, that's it. Just change the name. And then they send them out, and they want to say, like, okay, what's going to happen here, right? So which resume do you think are, do you think they would get the same callbacks, different callbacks, whatever? Do, how, what kind of responses do you think this would get? Either Emily Walsh and Greg Baker, these are the kinds of names, or Lakeisha Washington, Jamal Jones, et cetera. Izzy, what do you think? The white names are definitely going to get a callback. Why, why do you think that? Well, you, I remember we talked about this statistic before. It was with black men who were incarcerated and white men who were incarcerated, and then when they were, um, when they had no criminal record. Mm -hmm. And, um, like, the statistics were, like, maybe 17% wouldn't get a call back. And then when and black men who were incarcerated were less likely to, I mean, black women, men who had no criminal record were yeah. more, less likely to get a job than a, a white man with a criminal record, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so it's just, uh, I feel like, I'm, I'm not really sure how to describe, especially when it comes to like the job atmosphere, you know, like exactly what drives that kind of racism. Discrimination. The, yeah, that it, yeah. kind of discrimination, well, in this, yeah, in this situation. Um, like I, I really, I don't know what, really what's, what's like What's your gut, what's to? your gut feeling? Like what do you think drives it? What do you think it comes from? Well, like. Well, do you think? Do you think, for example, somebody is sitting behind a desk, looking at resumes, and they come upon, okay, I know I got to fill a job, right? And they come upon Greg Baker, and they're like, oh yeah, Greg Baker, all right. They come upon Jamal Jones. Oh yeah, Jamal Jones. What's going on? What do you think's going on in their head? Like, oh yeah, I don't like black people, so therefore, no, nah, not Jamal. Like. Um, for, at least for the recruiter, like if they're also white, yeah, that's and, what I was gonna say. <clears throat> yeah, and, and they like recognize like, oh, Greg Baker, oh hey, I recognize that last name, or like that name sounds familiar, yeah. maybe I knew somebody like. Like white solidarity, kind of. Yeah. 
I also feel like it may come from like a place where like even like they all have the same credentials, same education, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, it may also come from like, um, you know, what, in terms of like education, they may think that a black person who has the same education as a white person, they might have gotten into this school because of affirmative action. They may have, they may live in this zip code because yeah. they're on welfare or something yeah, yeah, like yeah. that. Like no matter what it is, the explanation for why a black person could be this way and a white person could be this yeah. way will always be different because they're trying to serve their own biases and they're trying to confirm what they already know and they already feel. Yeah, okay, by the way, you, that would be an argument against any kind of affirmative action, right? If affirmative action gives anybody the idea that somebody got something because they didn't fully deserve it, that would be a reason to not have affirmative action because like it's always going to be like like Alan here is or you but let's just say Alan always has that hanging over him like he might be an affirmative action kid maybe he only got into Penn State because of affirmative action maybe he only got the high GPA at Penn State because of affirmative action maybe he only got and I got X job, his previous job, because of affirmative action. So how do we ever know that this guy's talented if he's always been given something? That's the argument against exactly. affirmative action. But like that, I feel like that reasoning and like that that thought process when it comes to especially like when uh, people of color are successful, yeah. it, it, they're way more likely to have these write off these explanations, say this isn't really what it is, and it's not really that impressive or something like that. Well. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's sure. Like these things happen in people's mind. Were you going to respond to that? Yes. That's okay. Here. So let me show you this. So the white names got 50% more responses, right? Now we don't know. So we don't know why. You can't go inside of someone's head and say, I'm pretty certain that if you ask anybody who's doing recruiting for a job, if you ask anybody, certain, first off, they're not going to admit that, yeah, I chose Emily Walsh and Greg Baker because, I didn't, wait, what's your last name? Yeah, I have a very wide sounding name. My name is Alan Julian. Alan Julian. The <laughs> thing is that my full name, I don't put it on, I'm, I put my resume when I sign as Alan E. Julian. Alan E. Julian. And I pronounce it in English as Alan, but my name is Alan Eloy Julian Rodriguez. Uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I always, Rodriguez also. I take the Rodriguez away and the Eloy away, and I just put Alan Julian. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, oh, you're just an average white guy then. Yeah, so. like. Yeah. I'm you're more white than I am, man. <laughs> so, and with that name, yeah. you know what I mean? Really? Yeah, that's intense. Okay, so look, here's the thing. Why do you think people would choose white names? Like, what's your gut? Bro, what, yeah, what's your gut? My gut feeling? Just the same thing that both of them say, uh, like you're more similar and people make like assumptions on people. Yeah. It takes yeah. like 15 seconds for a recruiter to like, um, you know, bash your, yeah. your resume. So anything, even small things like that can like affect the bias that everyone has because everyone's a human, you know. So, no, we have bias. This yeah, is, listen, everybody, this is the everybody. bias that you can't see. If you ask anybody, they're going to say, no, they don't have bias. But this is, this is the problem with discrimination. You can't ever ask anyone because they'll always deny it, and they won't even necessarily know it. I may have a bias toward Emily and Greg over Lakeisha and Jamal that I don't even know about, and I don't want to have a bias. There's so many people who don't want to have a bias, including black and brown people who themselves have bias. You know, people who are black who are biased against black names, and they don't even realize it themselves, but they've like, kind of like, ah, oh, man, like, it's just part of what it is. And so the thing, what happens is people don't see the discrimination. And so it's very easy for any of us to be sitting here saying like, oh, but I don't, I don't discriminate. And like, I would never discriminate. Like that wouldn't be a problem for me. And they have a deep understanding or belief that they don't, but they don't see or understand their bias. Just like, I don't see my biases. I don't know who I'm biased against. Like, I don't know. And so if you grow up in a world, especially if you grow up in a world where you see things like this, and black men and white men and all men, you're just like, OK, well, why? Dude, I'm, I'm going to be down here with Michael, right? 
I'm not going to be down here with you because you're in this category here, right? I'm in the middle because I'm Panamanian, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So you know what I mean? Yeah. This is the thing. And so, so we know, and in the world of in prison, we, the, dude, if, if this is happening here, mm-hmm. if that's happening here with names at that level, what's going on here? What kind of discrimination is going on here? What kind of racism is built into something? Clearly, there's some. Yeah, I actually, I did my senior project on, like, something related to this, especially related to, like, drug crimes in America. Yeah. Especially, like, since the 80s here, um, we've experienced, like, a mass incarceration of black and brown people because of low-level, nonviolent drug crimes. Yeah. And, you know, I I remember around 33% of black men were more likely to get arrested. They were 45%, 47% less likely to get incarcerated and um, or to be detained and then like 70 something percent were likely to get arrested and, and to be and to get sent to prison so like almost every level of like the justice system yeah. of um, like a, a, a fair trial due process is generally denied to people of no, color hang on. don't say don't, you can't say that it's not denied it's like it's fair trial there's there are unfair aspects that enter in to the criminal justice system for black and brown people. It's disproportionately um, carried out. Okay, okay. That, that. You can say that. Yeah. Okay, that, that's a very different thing, right? Yeah, so, I'll say that. Okay. Yeah, because th- most of these, the likelihood of imprisonment, I mean, prison, that's going to jail. Most of this is going to be low-level drug crimes. It's not, this is not violent. This is not black men or Latino men or white men who are committing really violent felonies. These are just really low level. And so what you're saying is, yeah, if we look at the entire criminal justice system, you can find all these ways in which the unfairness enters in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, Here, I'm going to go back to this one because we, we did this. This is the one that you were talking about, and I just want to, I want to do it again because I think it has a lot of value. This is one of these audit studies, right? So what you do in these audit studies is you, you make certain that you control for everything that you control for. So when you find a behavior, a causal behavior or something that's different, we know we can attribute it to one thing or another. And so they did these white and black testers, right? So they, they do like, they find someone who looks like you, and then they find your equivalent who's white or brown, however it is, right? And then they, we train each other so that you shake hands the same way, you do the same amount of eye contact, you dress the same, you talk the same, you have the same teeth, the same everything. And then you go in and you apply for these jobs. And in this case, so Izzy, you were saying, so they took turns with the felon, having a felony drug charge, right? And you explained this. And... And we want to see what happens. And when you look at this, this, mar- this criminal record here, so when everything is the same, everything, the, the, the resume is the same, people present themselves the same, everything is the same, the people were more likely to choose a white person with a criminal record, 17% receiving callbacks, than choosing a black guy who has no criminal record. So these are exactly the same, except that the criminal record. And like, nobody who's doing the callbacks is going to say, I'm racist. Like, nobody is. But there's something, there's discrimination in there. So once again, I want to say, like, what, what 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 do you think we should do to stop this? Like, what do you think we could do? Michael. Um, I mean, like you said, right, everyone has bias. Nobody can ever claim, oh, I have no bias. Like like recruiters, for example. Oh, I have no bias when I'm mm-hmm. recruiting people or giving out callbacks. And like assuming that, let's say the recruiter's white, right, and then they see that this white person has a criminal record, they might think, oh, oh, like, they might sympathize with them or think, oh, like, this person, yeah, they did something bad, but 
maybe they grew from it, right? Or yeah. maybe even, maybe even like, oh wow, okay. Maybe even they say, oh, I did something similar in the past. Yeah. I, just, I just wasn't caught, yep. right? Uh, I, I sympathize with this person because I know what it, like, and you can sympathize a lot more with somebody that has the same. That looks like you. That looks like you, yeah. right? Because you can put yourself better Put yourself better in that situation. Yeah, in their shoes. In their yep. shoes and think, okay, I'll give this person a second chance. Okay, all right, dude. I hear that. M maybe, yeah, maybe that's it. Cle I don't think the, the people doing reading the resumes are racist. They're not sitting there being racist, but they're, what they've done is they at some level have inculcated a certain way of thinking about some groups of people that must exist in society somewhere. And people have the idea that, okay, you know, racism has gone away. Well, it hasn't gone away because it's built in somewhere as we're seeing, you know. Yeah, I realize I didn't actually answer the question, but like, I know it wasn't part of the actual case study, right? But I guess to solve like this issue specifically, yeah. right? Um, you could have a white recruiter and a black recruiter, they're both part of the callback process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And assuming they have, you know, equal say in yeah. all of this, right? Yeah. How much does that change things? Like, I don't know, but maybe yeah. having a second voice of reason. Yeah, okay, so this is one thing that people have started to do, like right. men and women and different. Is, Izzy, what, what would you, Hang on, I want, I, want to, I want you to comment on this, right? So there are two things. This study is actually about 20 years old, but here's what we've seen. In looking at like 25 years of these audit studies, we've not seen any decline. And we keep finding the same thing. People keep continuing to discriminate against black Americans and Latino Americans a little less. And not only that, but here's this other one. This person is just looking at this over and over again. And I saw there's something recently that this one person just put out. They're consistently finding this discrimination. Like, we keep finding it. No matter what, when we set up a study, we find it. So, Izzy, what do you, like, what do you make of that, that it's still there? Like, what would you say to people? Like, it's, who's saying there isn't any discrimination? Like, hey, but we're past that. Or not that there isn't, but it's not as bad as it was, and... Um, I mean, to people who feel like that racism doesn't exist and that discrimination really isn't a big issue, I mean, clearly they don't have to worry about it that much because they, well, not that they don't have to worry about it. But yeah, because a lot of black and brown people it. think that. Yeah, they don't think, well, a, a lot of black people and a lot of brown people, at least the, the black people that I've been, that I've surrounded myself with, is that, like, all, more often than not, they'll deny that something is racist. Like, we'll be making jokes and shit about, like, oh, that's racist, you're being racist right now. But, you know, in reality, when something actually happens, that they'll attribute it to something other than, you know, their blackness. Ah, and okay, wait, hang on a second. So what you're saying is, because a lot of white people, in particular, have this idea that black and brown and Asian people, whatever, people who are not white, are calling out racism all the time. And what you're saying is, actually, your experiences with black and brown people is like a lot of stuff, they, don't, they attribute it to something else. Why, why do they do that? Well, because coming to terms with the fact that something about your identity that you can't change, something that you wear on your skin every day, uh -huh. and something that, like, when you open your mouth, that it's instantly identifiable, yep. it's, really, it's really hard to come to terms with the fact that that is the reason why you will, that other people will get ahead in life. And Treat you, you a certain way. Yeah, 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 yeah. and, like, for me, um, you know, I'm biracial, so it wasn't, like, a, that big of an issue for me. But when I did, like, realize that what I was experiencing was racism, I, I really, I didn't want to believe it because I didn't want to believe that I could, I wanted to believe it was something about my character. Yeah, yeah, Or got something you. that I could change. I got you. But you can't change that. Oh, yeah, that's intense. Okay, and that's intense. Yo, I think that's a really, would you, what do you think about, yo. What do you think about that? Is, um, it, is that how it is in, in like, in I Panama? Think it, well, in Panama, I mean, very, Panama's a black nation, so it's different. I wouldn't but. call it a black nation. We're a black, not even a black majority. It's like 33% of yeah, the people okay. are black. So, and it's yeah. a very 
um, heterogeneous society. Yep. Okay. And we don't have like a racialized society like here in America. Yeah. Yeah, here yeah, in America, yeah. people are usually their ethnicity before their nationality. Yeah, yeah. I go as Panamanian. I don't go as Afro-Panamanian yeah. or Black Panamanian. I'm just Panamanian. And same thing with a White Panamanian or a Mitz one or a yeah. Chinese Panamanian. Yeah. We don't. We're just we're just Panamanian. So it's a little bit different. Uh, but here, the thing is that um, I don't mind answer questions that come from a place of ignorance. Yeah. Because it's the first time someone's gonna see a Black person that speaks Spanish. Like you know the amount of times that yeah. like wait what. I didn't yeah, know yeah, yeah. black people. Yeah, we, we do. Some of us, at least. And I don't mind answering questions like that. But if it's from a place of hate or like a mockery, then I would take it a different way. So what do you think? This is a final question. What do you think about what Izzy just said about people, like, like a, a certain willingness to deny that something maybe is based on racism? Because like you don't want to think that. Because thinking about it every day is exhausting. And do, yeah. I have a lot of things to do, and that's not one of the ones that I want to be doing. Dude. Awesome, man. Thanks. 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 Dude. Yeah, thanks. I think that... So, Julie, vamos a tomar el examen. Oh. La pregunta. Listen, this... Uh, I think it's a, it's a really interesting conversation because, for me, it's hard... It's just hard to talk about this stuff, you know? Like, we have a lot of data that's saying what's going on, but it's hard to talk about this. Yeah. Are we ready? Is it open? Okay, there you go. Hey, thanks, man. Thanks, y'all. Yeah.